Welcome, everyone. How are you guys feeling tonight? Welcome to the Dreamland Storyteller Series. Wow. I think before we start, I think we all need to celebrate the fact that we all got dressed, got out, got in the car, and got in a room with people. How important is this to all of us? I feel like we're really at a very, uh, it's a critical point. We need this for all of us. And I think that's why the Storyteller series is so incredible because people coming together to tell stories together in a room with strangers is a very, very powerful thing. And all these brave women have come together to do it tonight. So, with that, uh, I should tell you, my name is Doug Cody, if you don't know me. Uh, I'm a local musician and wannabe filmmaker. I had a podcast at one point, Nantucket's first podcast, and uh, called Inside the Whale. I like to think I lit the fire for everyone to start doing, that's what I tell myself. But uh, uh, I live out here, been out here 13 years, with uh, my wife Amy, who's here tonight and my daughter, Piper. Uh, so that's what I do out here. I probably know some, see all these familiar faces. You guys look great. Uh, I think tonight's stories that we're going to hear is about big decisions, right? Big decisions that change, it, change the course of your life, their lives, whatever. We've all had to do it. So before we let these wonderful women come up and talk about their decisions, I thought, I just give you a little bit of where I'm at with my big decision, and it has to do with Nantucket, which a lot of their stories do too. So what I'm struggling with, I feel there's a lot of undercurrent in the last two years since I've been out here. There's a little negativity about Nantucket. You hear it, you know? People are bitching. They're bitching, you know? Oh, I can't, the two months, how are we gonna get a reservation? Everyone's got a gripe, and everyone's got a trigger out here. I don't know, my trigger is construction. They're building out in front of my house, and every day I drive by and I see what's going on. They subdivided the lot, and I drive by the next day. Oh, of course, they're putting in a pool. Where's the water going to go? What are we going to do with all this water? How are we going to get the water? You start focusing on these little things. All of a sudden, I'm bitching about the take it or leave it. Oh, of course, they're not open Monday, Tuesday. This is ridiculous. <laughs> of course. Meanwhile, the take it or leave it is the most organized I've ever seen it. They have an employee there. Someone to help you. They love to tell you, oh, we can't take that. <laughs> but uh, I, I just feel like there is a general negativity, and I'm having to make, I'm choosing to make the decision. I should rephrase that. Choosing to make the decision to not focus on the hate and love. We need it. We need to love Nantucket now because it is changing. We all see it. But it's easy to hate, and it's hard to love. So, myself included, we need to learn to deal with the changes and give in to the power of love and not the hate, because it's there. You, we all hear it. So, my decision, that I, my big decision, is going to be believe in the love and love Nantucket. So with that, we'll bring up our first storyteller, Miss Sassy Nash. Come on up, Sassy. I think how do you bring it down? Like that? Hello. I'm a short person. All right. So at age 24, I have lost everything I ever wanted in my life. I lost the dream, the goal, and the home. And while I had a place to live and a family that loved me, I, start, I had to start all over again on my own. I went back to school to get a second bachelor's degree at the University of Central Arkansas. And the spring semester was life-changing. Theater appreciation class was on my schedule for my art requirement. And man, it did, I did appreciate that class. It introduced me to a world 
that I heard about, but I never experienced or understood. That same semester, the Broadway tour of Rent the Musical came to my campus. And like many 90 kids, I went crazy over that musical. <laughs> it was everything to me. I had fallen in love with theater. I found a dream. A few years later, the Weekend Theater in Little Rock was doing Rent, and I had to be part of that show. It didn't matter how, I just had to be part of it, even if it meant getting on stage. I found the goal. Unfortunately, auditions were done, and they were already halfway in rehearsal and getting ready to open in just a few weeks. So I made the big decision that to be part of that production, I was going to go to as many shows as possible. I purchased tickets for seven shows out of 12. I missed the opening night. It was sold out. So the, the second night, Friday, I went to the black box, and I sat in the front, and that show was everything to me. The Saturday night, I also sat in the front, and on Sunday, I asked the cast to sign my playbill. We've been talking about you backstage, say the guy playing Angel. <laughs> How exciting. The work week was too long, and I couldn't wait to go back to the theater. I had tickets for Saturday and Sunday, and for closing weekend, I had tickets for Friday and Saturday. The Sunday matinee show was canceled due to technical issues, and as I was standing in line to get my refund, a few of the cast members came from backstage and signaled me to go talk to them. Are you coming on Thursday, they asked. I don't have tickets for Thursday. You have to come. We have a surprise for you. They had these t-shirts that only the cast and crew will get. They were not for sale, and I really wanted one. Would that be my surprise? <laughs> Before I left, they asked me, what's your name? Sassy. I came back for the Thursday show, and I put my name on the waiting list. And I waited until everybody else was seated, hoping for one last ticket. Sassy, we have one ticket left. I paid for my ticket and went to the house. Just one seat left, right in the front. Is anybody sitting there? I asked the gentleman sitting next to it. Nope, it's all yours. I sat and the show began. The cast, the act actors were breaking the fourth wall with me by interacting, holding my hand, pointing at me, I was part of the show. Then during live support, the actors come on stage and they say the character's name. One of the actresses changed her name for mine. I'm sassy. My name was spoken on stage. And then during La Bibo Hem, Maureen Johnson, after her, her one night engagement at the 11th Street lot, moons the audience. <laughs> And as she pulls her pants down, I notice my name written on her rear end. Sassy rocks. During intermission, I was over the moon. I was too excited. I couldn't believe it. I was part of the show. And then they started to flicker the lights. So I, I went back to my seat. Towards the end, uh, Mimi's dying. But then she jumps over the moon with a leap of moo. And she was back. And they started to sing the finale. There is no future. There is no past. Thank God this moment is not the last. As the ensemble joined on stage, one of the actors pulls me on stage, and there I was, standing with them on stage, singing, there's only now, there's only this. I die without you, I die without you, no day but today. The guy playing Angel comes back on stage for the bows, and he gives me a t-shirt that only the cast and crew will get. 
I was so excited that I couldn't sing Seasons of Love at the end. <laughs> As the audience was leaving, the actors hugged me and finally introduced themselves to me. I went to see the show twice more, but that was not the last time I was in that theater. I started working with small, small jobs, and then the next summer I was backstage working as a production assistant. And then I did show after show after show. I was even on stage, although backstage is my favorite place to be. I found a family, I found a home. I felt safe, taken care of, and loved. A few years later, with my experience in connections at the Weekend Theater, I got a job as a stage manager for Arkansas Shakespeare Theater for the summer stock, and I went back as a company manager assistant. I have become part of that family as well. <sighs> the last show I did in, Lure in Arkansas was Rent at the Studio Theater in Little Rock, and then I moved to Massachusetts. And I had to find for my family and my home in this new state. Just a few months after I decided to stay on Nantucket, Laura Gallagher Byrne discovered me, and she invited me to be part of the Dreamland Stage Company family. And now I am the stage manager, company manager, educator, and everything and anything that I can do to support the children that do theater here. I got a dream, I got a goal, I got a home, but I also got a full-time job. <laughs> I get to do what I love for a living, and all because I decided to be part of a show, because I had to be, do it, I had to be part of it. I had to be part of the magical world of theater because I die without it. No day but today. Thank you. Well, this island loves you. Clearly, you are home. <laughs> and backstage, the true stage manager, she was yelling at us, places everyone, places. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Our next storyteller is Bintu Kamara. Bintu? All right. Uh, um, 5,025 pounds. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> oh my God. There are no mantras that could take this feeling away. <sighs> so, here we are. Um, yeah, so when this came around, I thought about telling a story, and everyone thought about, the more I thought about it, it was like, oh, I'll tell the story of how you ended up in Nantucket. And I'm like, eh, I had no master plan. It was just like, I just had a thought, and I was kind of creating a moat between myself and my expectations, I would say. After college, I graduated, and um, I lived at home, just working, and yeah, I just, one day I decided I'm gonna move to the closest place to paradise that I know. And I did it, moved here, and just never looked back. Um, when I got here, I got a job working for an amazing company with amazing women that took me in as family, and life was great. Fast forward a few years, I'm still gardening, frolicking in my fancy gardens, and <laughs> I get a job opportunity, and all of a sudden, it's like my world came crashing down. It's like, what do I do here? I'm in a great place working with great people that took that, you know, that I have dinners with, that I have holidays with. And I couldn't, I just couldn't leave them. And I'm just like, what is going on with me? Like, it's this is a great opportunity. You could turn gardening into a career, and why can't you just take that leap? And I'm like, okay, so this is what's happening. <sighs> I have completely intertwined my personal and professional relationships. Like my sense of identity, my self-worth, everything was tied into that job, into, do, into those relationships. So leaving it, I would have to start over and I would have to put myself out there again and rely 
and just pretty much start over. And I, did, I wasn't sure if I was ready for that. So of course, there goes a moral conundrum. It's like a week later, <laughs> my boyfriend is like, okay, I understand you are selfless. You know, all of these things are great. You take care of your people, but at the end of the day, who's gonna pay for the roof over your head while you sit down and enjoy your moral cookie? <laughs> I took the job. <laughs> so yeah, but I realized where I picked up that behavior from because at the end of the day, I was a people pleaser. You know, I, I just, I just never wanted to let anybody down. I felt like leaving that job and focusing on my own future somehow was letting somebody down. And, and I picked up those behaviors as a kid. See, I grew up in West Africa in a culture that is very community-based. And you know, you're expected to contribute and there were consequences if you didn't. If you did, it was great. If you didn't, you got judgy eyes. Really, really, <laughs> really stern judgy eyes. <laughs> And so, you know, being the youngest of a huge family, six kids, um, much younger than everybody, so pretty much anything that went around the house, people just, adults love to download their manifestos on children. Please stop. Everyone just, just tell me everything and just, you know, of course they assume that I'm too young to understand. So they would just download the information and I would just go around behind their back and play bin to fix it because I'm like, they don't know what they're doing. They don't communicate well, so let me just get in there and fix it myself. So I just spent my entire life fixing the adult problems in my life because it was much simpler to do it myself than to wash them all just, <laughs> just butt heads and communicate poorly. So <laughs> I'm like, all right, so note to self, stop doing that. Um, so I took the job and I, making that decision basically rewired my brain. It changed the way I approached everything, the way I approached my relationship, the way I, my motivation for things. Instead of doing it, I just, now I'm helpful just for the sake of being helpful. I do things because I, I can. If I can't, eh, that's fine, you know? I have zero expectations, not even low expectations. I have none because all, of expect, all, of, all expectations lead eventually to disappointments. So now if something good happens, eh, Bonus, kudos. Something bad happens, c'est la vie. And that's kind of how I've decided to move forward in life. And so far, everything has been great. Um, I, I've worked for a great company. I'm surrounded by great humans. I have awesome relationships with all of my family and friends. And yeah, and that's it. I live one foot on the beach and the other in the Milky Way. And <laughs> that's how we shall stay. Thank you. Thank you, Bintu. I kind of want to know more about judgy eyes, because my wife is is very good at that. I think that's what I call that. Judgy eyes. Wow, I like that. And uh, I heard a great quote the other day. Some of you may know it about expectations, and it. Uh, I got to remember now. Expectations are the foundation for disappointment. Whew. I heard that it was in a movie and I've like, I've rewound it. I'm like, that's amazing. Oh my God. It's true, right? All right, I'll just leave you with that one. There was no other thought. I was just gonna share that with you. Is that weird? All right, our next storyteller guys, Callan Duke. She's a, she's a veteran. My first storyteller session, we did it together. So she knows what she's doing, total pro. is an Abbott and Costello bit. <laughs> How's that? I think it's perfect. Good? Um, so um, I was thinking about the big decisions or risks that I've taken in my life, and I pulled them out and dusted them off like old photographs. I'm 17, and I make a momentarily bad decision, which I think we've all done at 17. Um, my father uh, is agnostic, and I decide to rebel against him by becoming a born-again Christian. <laughs> and it's my big rebellion. And he's livid. Um, but that wasn't enough for me. Uh, we lived in a small 
conservative desert town and the mini malls and the housing tracks, all of it, the, the normalness, it was suffocating to me. That wasn't me, I'm, I'm an adventurer. I needed something else. So I further rebelled from my father by um, signing up for a youth missionary trip in Papua New Guinea. <laughs> and I spent two months um, digging up stumps and preparing land in a jungle for an airstrip for the people that live along the Sepik River in a village there. Um, the Sepik the River is a muddy and roiling uh, river, and so my fellow volunteers and I decided it'd be a good idea to swim across it. And we barely make it across, and then we have to get back, so we barely make it back. The current is so strong. It's so much stronger than it looked from land. And the whole experience is made spookier by the fact that this is the same river where they pulled the crocodile out of the day before that we had for dinner. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm in awe of the women in the, the village who wear very little and go about their daily work um, wielding axes and chopping wood. They carry everything on baskets on their head going to and fro. I'm 24 and I leave the comfort of my West Coast home, all the familiarity and my family, and I go across the country to um, be a part of a PhD program in cognitive science in cold and windy Buffalo, New York. And um, while I'm there, the two years that I'm there, myself and fellow graduate students uh, talk about children's language acquisition without a child in sight. <laughs> it's all theory, 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 and my hands are aching to be used. Uh, so on a whim, I decide to go back to the West Coast, and I trade in my pencil for a pickaxe, and I become a wildland firefighter just outside of Portland, Oregon. And for two seasons, I hike up the steep mountainsides, hauling hose and laying line while the fire's encroaching. Um, one thing I remember in particular is watching the fire dance from treetop to treetop these giant pines that looked like they were just twigs dipped in kerosene lighting up. Um, I was one of two women on a team of 17, and I would go home at night and blow my nose and cough up gray dust. And I remember I would stand in the, the mirror and flex my muscles. They got so big, you should have seen them. <laughs> I am woman, hear me roar! <laughs> um, and it was amazing. <laughs> I'm... 35, and um, against the protestations of my family with vague concerns of terror and uh, destruction, I fly to Beirut, Lebanon, where I become a teacher. Um, I go there without thinking about it much, and I live there for two years, and I absolutely love it. I eat uh, fancy French pastries and boulangeries next to buildings that are crumbled and pockmarked from the Civil War. I surf in the Mediterranean, and I smoke the um, Argili pipe, and there, the airport is shut down a couple times while I'm there due to internal violence, and I get used to the sound of machine gun fire, which is from their weddings, naturally. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> baklava, and baba ganoush, and manouche, and lebne, uh, my belly is always full. I have uh, elderly Lebanese neighbors who take pity on this, this woman all alone in a strange country. And so they bring me platefuls of food, and I call them Tata, a Lebanese grandmother. And everywhere I go, there's music and conversation and laughter. I'm 37, and um, I decide to go to India to teach the children of Bollywood actors and directors. And the children on the streets of Mumbai, who are less fortunate, are tug at my pant legs as I walk to work, and they stop the rickshaw, and they rub their bellies and point at their mouth to show how hungry they are. The rivers run with sewage and things that I can't and don't want to identify. Even the ocean crests with plastic bags and old clothing. It's so overwhelming the poverty and the, the pollution and all the people, it, I, I feel helpless. And so when a friend mentions she saw a surf trip to the Andaman Islands online, I decide to go without thinking. And so I show up in Port Blair um, 
with my fellow surfers, the team that I'm going to go with, and they're from all over the world. Not, I don't know any of these people. They're from India and Argentina and England and Saudi Arabia and Dubai. And we spend two weeks on a yacht. <laughs> And uh, we spend our days, it's straight out of a surf movie, we spend our days you know, searching for waves with binoculars and then paddling out to breaks that have probably never been surfed before and uh, wait in the water and watch monkeys climb up trees while we're waiting and catch glassy wave after glassy wave until our arms are sore. And then we paddle back to the boat and eat a fish that someone caught off the side of the boat. There may have been a holiday romance with a shake. And <laughs> I'm, I'm 48, and I live in Nantucket. And I meet a man from Sharon, Massachusetts, on a dating app during COVID. And um, I'm very cautious, because in another life, I might have called him dull, because he's gentle, and he's quiet. And there's very little drama between the two of us. And slowly, one foot in front of the other, I start to open myself up to him as we go on hikes uh, on the Cape and thrift store shopping. And we go on dates to the library. <laughs> um, the last two years of our lives have been dominated by doggy walks and home-cooked meals. I've even learned to make soup. <laughs> and um, a couple of days ago, we signed a lease for a house in Wayland, Massachusetts, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, there's a Dunkin' Donuts and a Starbucks not too far from where we're gonna live. And pretty soon, we'll move in together and we'll decorate the house and we'll continue to build a life together. And um, ne next week, we're gonna go shopping for a bed. <laughs> and it's really, really terrifying and very, very beautiful. And um, I, firefighting and surf trips and world travel, that was nothing. Letting myself be open to love and falling in love, that's the biggest risk that I've ever taken. All right. <laughs> Love. Theme, right? But you're leaving Nantucket. Oh, that didn't tie in with my little thing. But congratulations, because when you feel it and it's real, it's good, right? Everyone, everyone deserves to be good and loved, so congrats. All right, our next storyteller, Cavell. Cavell Madison. She's a familiar face here on the island. She needs no introduction. She'll tell me if it's wrong. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming out, especially my 11-11 girls. <laughs> it was January 14, 2020. I was sitting in my hotel room in Italy. It was my birthday. I was supposed to be celebrating with some friends, but I sat there crying. I cried tears of joy. Because for the first time in my life, I felt like a burden was lifted off these tiny shoulders. My daughter that same day moved to California. It was the first time that I could actually sleep without any cares in the world. As a parent, that's one of the biggest concerns. What she doing? She was no longer my problem. I was in Italy just sleeping and I slept for about 10 hours. <laughs> I felt so good. But backtrack two years ago, 2018, actually even further, 
I ran away from home at age 16. I grew up in a very religious, a religious, a religious oppressed home. My grandmother was very strict. She was more of a bitch. My aunt, they were, they were very cantankerous, so it was strong women. But when I ran away from home, I lived with my church brothers and sisters. I was known as a country bumpkin, very ugly, just like not the most attractive person. No one wanted to be around me, but at one thing with me, I was determined as hell. If you tell me that I couldn't jump in that hole, I would jump in that hole just to prove you wrong. So I lived with church brothers and sisters, and somehow, as soon as someone's like, you gotta go, I'm like, okay, thank you. Pat my little yellow bag. That little yellow bag led me to Nantucket. <laughs> Came here in 2001, worked at the Jared Coffin House, worked at the Bean, I worked catering. And then a decade had passed, 2018. That was a year for me to make a small decision, a small decision to honor me, love myself. I was burnt out, I decided to leave my job. I did well as a concierge, one of the top selling reservations agent for NIR. I did catering, I did it all, also juggling, Parenting, I never call my mom, myself a single mom, I hate that term, a single parent. I was doing that, I was taking care of my daughter, but I was just tired, I was angry, I was vent resentful. What am I doing? And so the opportunity came up for me to switch from the hospitality life to sustainable Nantucket, where I met with my friend Amy, and I became the first farmer's market manager, a Jamaican farmer's market manager. How huge is that? That was big. One of my life goals was to um, create a food festival, to host one. I was in charge of that. That year, it was so great. I can't believe I did a food festival. And everyone knows from my Instagram that I love cooking food. Food is huge for me. Mana that wasn't the only thing that happened. That year, my daughter was going to go to college, so I worked my ass off. I remember it was Boston Pops that August. I was supposed to meet with someone so they could um, give us a van for Sustainable Nantucket. At about like 12.30, I fainted. I passed out. I was overworked, stressed out. They were like, call the ambulance. I'm like, nope. And they're like, if you know her, she's stubborn. She's going to drag herself to that meeting, and she's going to get it done. And I did. But around 2020, you know, a month later after I got back from Italy, I got this email. Dear Cavell, I hope you're happy where you are. But we just opened up two great positions, house manager, and events planner. So I shared the email with Callan, who was working with, and I was like, <laughs> me, Westmore Club, I have a bachelor's degree, I never went to college, I, I, I can't do this. And she's like, what are you talking about? She's like, sit down. And she lectured me, <laughs> respectfully. And she's like, go, listen to what he has to say. So I went, I was dying inside, but I listened. And I went home and I spoke with my daughter and she's like, mom, hospitality runs through your vein. You are the queen of hospitality. You take charge. You're not living up to what people expect of you. Everyone thinks that you're amazing, but you don't see yourself as amazing. This is your opportunity. This is your chance. So I made the decision to go forth, even though I didn't know a lot of things. And today I can say I am the house manager at the Westmore Club, an all white country club. I'm loved, I'm respected. And yes, I ran away from home, but I ran to something great because discipline and hard work pays off. So never doubt yourself. 
no matter what people say. And just so you know, all my classmates who made fun of me, I won't say the rest. Thank you. <laughs> Well done, Cavell. Right on. I love that. When we got together this week hearing these stories from these fine women, it was very, I was driving home all teared up. It was very empowering. Uh, our last storyteller is a life coach. And a little side note is I went to high school with Trish. And grew, we grew up in Syracuse, and I didn't know she was out here. And when I first got off the boat on the High Line, I went right to Cambridge Street, and Trish was there. And Trish hired the first band I played, and we used to play at Cambridge Street. So it's kind of come full circle that these, and I, for, for whatever reason, Nantucket has a big central New York community. I didn't know that, but there's a lot of people from Syracuse here. So it kind of felt like my home, and then when I saw Trish, I was like, wow, a lot of Syracuse people were home, huh? So, Trish Law, everybody. Is that going to work for you? I think so. We're going to have to find a high. I'm the only one that gets a cheat sheet. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Doug and I went to high school together. That's, we were in a remedial math class together. So, for the kids that have a resource room, look at us now. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. Um, I, I know a lot of you know my story. I'm so excited to share this with you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of take you back. We're going to go in a DeLorean. We're going to throw on the flux capacitor. And I'm going to take you back to the first beginnings of this story to kind of make this sense of all this. So in 2000, I was just leaving Syracuse University. Um, and I was working in a restaurant, as all art majors do. Uh, I worked at the Dinosaur Barbecue. If you've ever been in Syracuse, New York, it's the place to go, right? Um, it was a, it's a biker bar. My parents, I'm sure, were very proud. Um, so uh, my mom says to me, she calls me one day, and she goes, you know what? I think we need to go on a girl's trip. And I said, OK. And at the time, my brother Jimmy, I'm sure many of you know him, was living out here uh, uh, for the summer and working. And she's like, let's go visit Jimmy. And I said, great. Now at the time, I was working at the dinosaur. It was a great job. And uh, for a kid like me that was trying to pay for school. And I had a live-in boyfriend at the time. And, uh, you know, my roots were kind of there. But it was just, you know, there wasn't really a lot of future. Let's just put it that way. Um, so we came here. And we got on the, we were in Hyannis to get on the boat, and it was a foggy day. I'm sure you're shocked. And I have a little anxiety, so if you know me, I'm a little anxious. So we get on the boat, and it was rocky, and I was anxious. And my mother, in her sort of purest form, decided that I was too annoying to sit next to. So she left me on the boat and left me alone. Uh, so I was sitting on the boat by myself, just me and my nerves. And... I started to see that we were getting closer to Nantucket. Again, I'd never been here, so I didn't know what to expect at all. And honest to God, you guys, it was like a movie. The, I swear, the sun came out. I started to approach that backdrop. You know what I'm talking about. Like, you come to the boat, and you're like, oh, my God. The only other time I've had a feeling like that was the first time I saw Michael Jackson do the moonwalk. That was the only other time, <laughs> right? So we get there, and before the boat docks, my mother approaches, and she must have seen that I was distracted from my anxiety. And I looked at her before the boat docked, and I said, Mom, I'm going to live here. And she, of course, responded as my mother would, and many of you know my mother, and she just rolled her eyes. So long story short, I went home and I began to disassemble on my life in Syracuse. I sounds like a song. I broke up with my boyfriend. I quit my job at the dinosaur. I moved back in with my mother so we could kind of figure out that interim. And over the next eight months, I started to construct my life here. I didn't know a soul when I moved here. I moved here, it'll be 21 years ago, April 1st of 2001. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm saying that. Anyway, so 10 years of my life I spent on this island and I... The minute I got off that boat, I will remember it for the rest of my life. My little red Honda Civic drives onto the, the island. It was my home. My love affair with this island 
it is creepy how much I love this island. It is really not, I mean, really, like my obsession with Michael Jackson in Nantucket is pretty much adjacent. So I began my life here. It was a beautiful life. I owned a restaurant, um, Cambridge Street. Many of you probably had been patrons there. I have friends. My girlfriends are like my sisters, and I know a few of you are here tonight, so I'm so grateful for that. I got married and I had two little natives, Caroline and Sully. They were born right at Nantucket Cottage Hospital. Um, and I've always had this mantra about the island and I, you know, of course have this creepy attachment to it, but I've always had this mantra, if you take care of Nantucket, she's gonna take care of you. That was literally my mantra, right? If you take care of her, she'll take care of you. And I lived by that mantra. But as the universe always likes to test us a little bit, um, it basically threw me sort of a curveball. And my curveball came in the form of a divorce and coming into single parenthood. That was like the hardest level of Super Mario Brothers yet. It was really challenging. So for the first time in my relationship with my beloved girl, Nantucket, I started to waver in my trust of that statement. If you take care of Nantucket, she will take care of you and vice versa. Um, and so I got spooked. I got really scared. I wasn't sure as a single parent I was going to be able to make it out here. Um, fear is a powerful emotion. And I'm sure I was going through a lot of trauma. It was a divorce. If anybody's ever been through that, you know what I'm talking about. It's really tough. So I made the responsible choice. And I decided to uh, pack my things up and head back home. So it's one of the hardest decisions I ever made in my life. I literally, it was like a country song, left this island with my truck, everything I could fit in it, my two kids. And I, when I went back to Syracuse, I also went back to school at the time. I got a degree in exercise science, and I began to rebuild my career. So I got to Syracuse. It was Syracuse, you know? It was great. It was, it was enough. We had, I had success there. I started a company. It, we had 32 employees, um, 9,000 square feet. All things were looking good. On paper, things were good. I was on the news. I was on live TV. They had to tell me every day not to curse, and that was probably a good thing. <laughs> you know me. Um, and I became a Lululemon ambassador. All these things I ever wanted to do started to happen for me, but it just never felt right. I felt like when I was there, despite all the things on paper that made sense, you know those salmon that like kind of go upstream and you can see that they're fighting the current? Like, I just didn't fit there. So basically, the one good thing that came out of that was I met my husband, Alan, and some of you do know him, but I truly think as my soulmate, I think one of the sole purposes for me going back to Syracuse was to go get him. So uh, basically, we disassembled the business, which was another story entirely, and I started to just move into one-on-one -on -one coaching. That was kind of my thing. I wanted to simplify things. My husband, Alan, was a coach at Syracuse University, and he coached field hockey. So we had the insurance. We had all the things that make sense. But still, like, the closer it got down, I just felt like I was grieving Nantucket. And it was, like, kind of this jealousy thing with Alan when, like, every time I brought it up, he would get, like, jealous about it. So I couldn't, like, talk about it. So I felt like I was grieving, and I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And then COVID hit. So we're sitting in our bed, as we did every morning at that time, and my Scottish husband started meditating. I can't even believe I'm saying that. Anyway, so we started talking about stuff because we could realize the certainties of life were not the same anymore. Like, the things we thought were real weren't real. Like, Alan wasn't coaching at Syracuse anymore. My one-on-one -on -one personal training clients and my life coaching people, I wasn't able to see. So we started to kind of see, like, the glitch in the matrix, if that makes any sense. And... Alan says, well, what would you do? What, do you, what, what are we doing here? And I said, I don't know. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And the minute he gave me that shot, I was like, I want to go home. I just want to go home. And he's like, I think we could probably do a summer. A summer. Let's see how it goes. So he gave me permission. And if anybody knows me and I have one ounce of permission, I'm going straight towards it. So I sat down and I poured myself a glass of wine and I started to write something out that I thought would work on the year-round community page. Now, I was a little buzzed when I wrote it, but I thought, like, I just wanted to get it out of me. I had to get that out, and I just was going to, like, basically launch it into the universe and see what happens. So I want to read that post to you today, if that's okay. Um, oh, God, I'm going to try not to cry because it's crazy. I'm standing here. Uh, May 15, 2020. Hello, Nantucket. My name is Trish. Uh, I live outside of Syracuse, New York with my husband, Alan, and our two children, Caroline and Sully. I'm about to put something into the universe that scares me. 
but I think it's important to do things that intimidate you. Plus, I've had the supportive nudge of a few friends who are in this room, by the way. So here it goes. I love Nantucket. I don't mean I love it just because it's beautiful or because of the energy of summer. I love Nantucket down to its complex and messy soul. I love Nantucket in the middle of January. I love Nantucket for its year-round characters because, and because of her sometimes ear incomprehensible paradoxes. I love her like a person, and I think she loves me back. Currently, I'm in central New York. It's okay, like moderately okay. In other words, it's where dreams go to die. Uh, <laughs> we manage here. My husband, sorry, Syracuse. My husband coaches at Syracuse University, and we are so grateful for that. I have a decent coaching practice myself. On paper, we're successful. But ever since I left Nantucket eight years ago, I have felt like a well-meaning organ that got transplanted into a body that completely rejects it. This is not my home. It has never felt like it. OK, why am I writing this? Before this whole pandemic began, I sat down and wrote about what I wanted. I wrote about where I felt I belonged. And I wrote about where I knew I could add value. Even if it was impossible, I wrote it. The first thing on my list was spending at least, if not if nothing else, one summer on Nantucket with my family. It's funny that only people who understand what the real estate market is like on this island would know how impossible that written desire could be. I didn't give a shit. I wrote it anyway. <laughs> I shared it only with the people who would not laugh at me. Some of you are in this room. Uh, when COVID happened, my husband couldn't coach at Syracuse anymore. I couldn't see clients in person anymore. We are in Syracuse just being there. I felt like I was in some weird purgatory, as I'm sure some of you can relate to. It made me feel sad in a way I can't fully describe. I had to wreck it with things I hadn't in a long time. My husband and I have battled about my love for Nantucket. My children are both natives. My brother and my best friends live here. And my husband had lots of resistance to Nantucket, mainly because he felt like it contained a history that didn't include him. He's never had the chance to see it from more than an outside person's perspective. When the pandemic happened, we started to share things with each other we hadn't in a long time. I shared with him my Nantucket summer dream thing. For the first time in six years, he softened to it. It was a start. Long story short, this is what I'm putting out there. I'm looking for a somewhat reasonably priced, long-term two-bedroom summer rental from at least June to September. We're willing to quarantine upon arrival. I have the ability to work doing, due, due to generous and amazing opportunities, you know who you are, uh, on the island, if I can find housing. My ex-husband will also be on island for most of the season. My children had friends and cousins to play with, and my husband will have the opportunity to see what this beautiful community is about with all of, without all of my baggage and nonsense. We can serve Nantucket so much better than we can serve Syracuse right now, and I think it could serve us. We have dozens of year-round references. We're not looking for fancy. We need a place we can afford and one that offers us the leverage we need to show up for Nantucket. The summer season of all of this seems like a great place to start. Two bedrooms and a bath. That's all we're looking for. Please let us know if you have anything that we should follow up on. Thank you so much, love. So I put that out, and before I pushed send, I think I consumed a bottle of wine. My husband had to physically take my finger and put it onto the button so that we push send, and then I launched it into the universe. And within two days, we had our housing. Two days, two days, which is amazing. So we got here, and it was amazing, but summer was waning, and we could feel the lease beginning to come close to an end. And every single time I thought of the end of summer, I felt like I was going to die. I literally could not imagine getting on the boat and going home. So my husband can certainly feel this. It was a difficult time. And my landlord, I don't know if you know Chris and, ha and Pat Hancock, those are my landlords, she called me and she goes, how are you doing? And I said, Chris, I feel like I'm going to die. And she goes, OK, not to complicate things, but we adore you and your family, and we would be willing to offer you the house year round if you would be interested in staying. Now, you guys know it's like impossible. It's impossible, right? Um, 
So long story short, we accepted that offer. My husband stayed at Syracuse for another year to complete his obligations there, and we moved here as a family, all four of us, in May of 2021. So that was almost a year ago we came here. Um, I shouldn't be here. It's nonsensical, right? If I was trying to figure that out with my head, it would have never made sense, ever. It had made, it made sense to my heart, right? So coming home to me, it was such a contrast of knowing where I belonged and where I didn't. And so if anything, at the end of this, the one thing I wanna leave you with is sometimes the knowing that you have inside of yourself is nonsensical. It's not gonna make sense on paper but there's that internal wisdom that you can always, always rely on, right? And that's what I relied on to get back here and be in this room with you. And for that, I am so grateful. Thank you so much. Excellent, Trish. I feel like there's probably some people out there that are still reading that post. It's that long. How did anyone get through that? <laughs> was that? I mean, when I see that, I'm like, next. <laughs> How many pages was that? Oh, my God. But it worked. I like that. The universe in Nantucket work. And uh, I think that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give all these courageous women a round of applause. Thank you to the Dreamland, the Storyteller series. And let's all love the island a little more and let's not give in to the hate because love always wins. Good night. <laughs>